Welcome to the first episode of this series of EY video on the implementation of the new LISA standard, IFRS 16, which has become effective this year, 2019. The objectives of these short videos are to provide helpful reminders during the first year when IFRS 16 is effective and to share with you some of the latest insights which could affect IFRS reporters. Today is July the 3rd, 2019. My name is Michiel van der Lof. I'm the EY EMEA IFRS leader. In this episode, we will discuss the discount rates a lessee is required to use when transitioning to IFRS 16. I'm joined by Victor Chan. He's an international director at EY Global in London and also a member of EY's Global IFRS Services team and amongst others, member of the EY's Global Lisa Subject Matter Group. Victor, welcome. I'm glad to be here. As a starting point, let's talk about the basic requirements of IFRS 16 in respect of discount rates before we move on to the specific transition guidance. We often hear about key terms like rate implicit of the lease and incremental borrowing rates. Which ones should a lessee use as the discount rate? A lessee is required to use the interest rate implicit in the lease if that rate is readily determinable to the lessee. The interest rate implicit in the lease is defined in the standard as a rate of interest that causes the present value of the lease payments and the unguaranteed residual value to equal the sum of the fair value of the underlying asset and any initial direct costs of the lessor. If the interest rate implicit in the lease is not readily determinable by the lessee, the lessee is required to use its incremental borrowing rate, which is also defined in the standard. The incremental borrowing rate is the rate of interest that the lessee would have to pay to borrow over a similar term and with a similar security the funds necessary to obtain an asset of a similar value to the right of use asset in a similar economic environment. That's helpful. We often receive questions about the discount rates to be used upon transitioning to IFRS 16. Could you walk us through the requirements? Sure, Mihil. Um, to answer that question, I think the first step is to determine the transition approach an entity has chosen. Uh, as a lessee, IFRS 16 allows for two transition approaches. Firstly, the full retrospective approach, which means that IFRS 16 is applied retrospectively over each prior reporting period presented using IS8, accounting principles, changes in accounting estimates, and errors. If the lessee uses the full retrospective approach for transition purposes, it will have to go back to the commencement date of each existing lease, both existing operating and finance leases, to assess the discount rate. And this usually means restating the prior year comparatives. The second permitted approach is the modified retrospective approach, which means that the entity recognizes the cumulative effect of initially applying IFRS 16 as adjustment to the opening balance of retained earnings or other components of equity as appropriate at the date of initial application, which is 1-1-2019, for calendar year-end entities, and there is no restatement of prior year comparatives. A transition approach is applied consistently across all the leases under transition. However, with respect to the right of use assets under the modified retrospective approach, on a lease-by-lease -lease basis, an entity uh, can choose either to measure the right of use assets at a carrying amount as if IFRS 16 had been applied since commencement or at an amount equal to the lease liability adjusted by the amount of any prepaid or accrued lease payments related to that lease. So the measurement of the right of use assets at the date of initial application under the modified retrospective approach doesn't affect discount rate used. So what are the major difficulties we've seen for entities assessing the appropriate incremental borrowing rate when the full retrospective approach is used for transitioning purposes? Well, there are many questions about assessing the discount rate, but let's focus on those related to transition under the full retrospective approach. First of all, a lessee needs to go back to the commencement date of every lease classified as an operating lease under IS-17, the legacy leases standard, um, to gather information in order to assess the discount rate, among others. Thus, the full retrospective approach is usually more time consuming. It is also possible, for example, that information for very old leases 
could be difficult to retrieve and recover. What's more, a lessee may be required to remeasure the lease liability every time when there's an event that triggers remeasurement after the commencement date of the lease but prior to the initial date of application. A lessee may also be required to use a revised discount rate under certain remeasurement prior to the date of initial application, for example, when there is a change in lease term or modification. So it is important to understand when a revised discount rate is required in a remeasurement situation. That's a good point. It also sounds a bit complicated. I think you've prepared a couple of examples to illustrate the point. Yes, there are a couple of examples in the slide deck which illustrate when the full retrospective approach is used. For the first example, the lease commences on January the 1st, 2015 with a non-cancellable period of five years and there's a lessee's renewable option for another five years exercisable on January the 1st, 2020. Assume that at commencement, the lease term is for five years and it was not reasonably certain that the renewal option would be exercised. The interest rate implicit in the lease was not readily determinable and the incremental borrowing rate at that date of 5% is used to calculate the lease liability on commencement. On July 1, 2018, the lessee commits to and begins to construct significant investment in leasehold improvements. The new leasehold improvements have significant value at the end of the 18 months remaining in the lease term. This represents a significant change in circumstances that is within the control of the lessee and affects whether the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise a renewal option not previously included in its determination of the lease term. In this situation, the lessee reassesses the lease term as required by the standard and concludes that it is at this date now reasonably certain that the renewal option will be exercised. The change in the lease term means that the lessee remeasures the lease liability using the revised lease term. The lessee can't readily determine the interest rate implicit in the lease for the remainder of the lease term and therefore uses the incremental borrowing rate at the date of reassessment. This is assumed to be 4% per annum. The increase in lease liability increase in a corresponding increase in the right of use asset. Thank you. That's a great example of where after commencement date and before transitioning date, the discount rate is actually reassessed. Can we now talk about the second example, which is also based on the full retrospective method? Sure. For the second example, the lease also commences on January the 1st, 2015, and there is a non-cancellable lease term of five years. The lease does not contain a renewal option. The lease payment is 100 per annum, payable in arrears, with a market rent review on January the 1st, 2018. Again, assume that the interest rate implicit in the lease is not readily determinable, and the incremental borrowing rate of 5% is used to calculate the lease liability on commencement. When the market rent review takes place on January the 1st, 2018, the lessee is required to remeasure the lease liability as there's a change in the cash flows on that date. The increase in the lease liability also results in a corresponding increase in the right of use asset. However, in this situation, the standard requires the lessee to use the revised future lease payments to remeasure the lease liability without updating the discount rate. Two very good examples of uh, the application of the full retrospective method. Can we now move on the modified retrospective approach? Are there many differences compared to the full retrospective approach? Yes, there are some differences, Mikhail. Um, the modified retrospective approach uh, does not involve the restatement of prior year comparatives and for leases previously classified as operating leases under IS-17, the discount rate is measured on the date of initial application, not on the date of commencement of the lease. Another difference is that the transition requirement is clear that a lessee is required to measure the lease liability at the present value of the remaining lease payments using the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. This means that a lessee can't use the interest rate implicit in the lease, even if it's readily determinable. There's a practice question on whether the incremental borrowing rate should be measured using the full lease term or the remaining lease term. The transition guidance is actually not entirely clear on this, 
and thus an entity may make its accounting policy and apply it consistently across leases upon transition. If a lease has been previously classified as a finance lease under IS-17, then the carrying amount of the right of use assets and the lease liability is the carrying amount of the lease asset and liability immediately before that date measured using IS-17. Thus the question on assessing the discount rate on the date of initial application for transition purposes is not relevant in these situations. Can we now go back to the first example of the five-year lease with the renewal option, where we apply the full retrospective approach and illustrate the requirements for the discount rate to be used when the modified retrospective approach is being applied? Certainly. As we have explained in the first example, the lease commences on January the 1st, 2015. The non-cancellable period was five years and the renewal option was for another five years. Let's assume that the entity decided to use hindsight, which is one of the practical expedients available on a lease-by-lease -lease basis when the modified retrospective approach is used. While the original lease term was five years, the lease term has since been revised to 10 years in total after the remeasurement on January the 1st, 2018. On the date of initial application of January the 1st, 2019, assuming that the lessee has a calendar year end, the lessee will determine the discount rate using the incremental borrowing rate, not the interest rate implicit in the lease, at that date with either the original lease term or the remaining lease term applied consistently under its accounting policy. The lessee does not use the discount rate on commencement date, nor the revised discount rate assessed in the example. Let me do a quick summary of the main points here. In order to appropriately determine the discount rate, first an entity needs to decide on the transition approach. If the full retrospective approach is adopted, the entity will first need to determine the interest implicit in the lease on commencement, if it is readily determinable, and it's generally not. Otherwise, it uses the incremental borrowing rate on the commencement date. A lessee needs to evaluate if there's any remeasurement event up to the date of initial application, and this may require determining additional discount rates at each reassessment date. If the modified retrospective approach is used, then the discount rate has to be the incremental borrowing rate assessed on the date of initial application of the lease classified as an operating lease under I-617. The lease term used for the interest rate can be the full lease term or the remaining term applied consistently as a policy choice. That's perfect, Mihail. Thanks, Victor. I think we've come to the end of the first episode of this series of EY video on the implementation of IFRS 16. Thank you for watching. My name is Michiel van der Lof, and we will bring you more insights on IFRS 16 on further videos. Mm -hmm.